Hello everybody, I'd like to read today from Joshua chapter 3 um, where the Israelites had camped along the banks of the river Jordan waiting to cross over. I'm going to read from verse 5 of chapter 3. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Very important for them to know that. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord... The Lord of all the earth set foot in the Jordan. Its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. That would be an amazing miracle. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was in flood all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a place called Adam, in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of the Arabah was completely cut off. So the people crossed over to the opposite Jordan to the other bank. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, dry ground, while the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Hundreds of thousands of Israelites, now under the leadership of Joshua, had seen the most incredible, incredible miracle. They were in a place where everything was changing. That's why I've called this talk Changing Landscapes. They'd been in the desert for 40 years and now they come up to the edge of the Jordan and it's in flood. And they, this amazing miracle allows the whole nation to cross over. They all witnessed a massive display of God's power and they were part of it as they walked across this amazing flooding river. It completely dried up. It had been at moments before deep and dangerous. Then the ark came carried by the priest came into stood. And as soon as their feet touched the edge of this raging river, it stopped. And the whole nation, young and old, were able to cross over safely. Maybe while they were there, they'd been there a few days before this and see this raging torrent. And they might have thought, well, my goodness, how are we going to cross this river? It's impossible. We can't do it. Why? It seems to be the wrong time of the year. Uh, the, the snows of the snows of Herman are melted and they're filling the river with water. Wouldn't it be better come in high summer when there was so much, so before, after the snows had long melted? You know, we get all these thoughts about how God might do things or not do things. We think often we know better at ways. But listening to what God says makes the impossible possible. And the Holy Spirit wants us to see that as we see this story. Hundreds of thousands of people on the riverbank of a raging river. But God's in control. And God's going to show the people that they've got a great leader in Joseph, Joshua, even though now Moses is dead. And so he said to them, come and listen to the words of the Lord. The moment the priest's feet touch the water, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up. In a heap. Only God can make water stand up in a heap. We can do it by building a dam, but God doesn't have to build dams. He's in control of nature. 
Can I just say this? You may not realise the magnitude of this miracle. But if you look at a map, it's incredible. Uh, it says that the river piled up a great distance away at a town called Adam. And from where they were by Jericho to the where the water flowed away to Adam, 25 miles. 25 miles of dry riverbed. And all the people crossed over. And Joshua said this to them. He said, this miracle is going to prove to you that when we're in the land, God will conquer your enemies. He will be your victory. You will defeat with him the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites and the Jebusites. You will be victorious. You see, Joshua had known for some time that God was with him. He'd had a personal touch from God Words from God. You can read about them in the book, earlier on in, in the book of Exodus. In the book of Joshua. Be strong and of a good courage. Do not be afraid. The Lord your God is with you. With you, Joshua. Wherever you go. That would mean crossing rivers and going into enemy territory. God promises to be with him. Jesus promises to be with us. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll always be around for you. Wonderful assurance when trouble comes to us, particularly in these difficult times we live in. Joshua believed God's promise that God was with him. As he had been with Moses, so he is with now with Joshua. And we can see Israel facing these changing landscapes, places they'd never been seen before. Uh, <laughs> Moses was dead. They'd mourned his loss for 30 days. Maybe they thought, well, we really need a good leader now, but we've lost him. No, no, no. God has made provision for another leader. We must never be hasty in doubting the way God does things. The Lord knows our weaknesses. We've got plenty. But he knows how to do things to build our trust in him. And uh, he does it with this, firstly, with this amazing miracle of a flooding Jordan. Okay, he'd say to the nation, you think things are hopeless, but I'm in charge. You say my time is wrong? No, it isn't. This is my sign to you, this miracle, this amazing miracle, to show you I'm with you all the way. Um, it says here, this wonderful leader who succeeded Moses. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. And after the death of Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, now you get these people ready to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land. They had to consecrate themselves. They had to take measures to get right with the Lord and, and, be, and be ready. And he said, consecrate yourself, and they did. They prepared themselves for this miracle in which they were going to be part of. And then, of course, when they're in the land, they're faced with something, another difficulty. It's the end of a daily miracle that they'd experienced for 40 years manna provision. Verse 12, the manna stopped the day after they ate the food from the land. They'd been provided with food every day without fail from God's miraculous hand for 40 years. And now they're in the land. But we read that they then began to eat the food they hadn't planted. God had planned for them to arrive in the land at harvest time when there was food to eat. And he allowed an overlap of 24 hours. No breaking provision between the manna stopping and the food on the land. It overlapped. In a sense, he gave them a double portion for a day. A double blessing for a day. He's really saying, don't worry. Uh, I'm in charge. I will supply all your needs. He says it to us as well. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So today we're in a wonderful place as they were then. But things have changed. For the Israelites now it's not so easy to eat. No more do they collect the manna that falls right by the tent door with no anxiety about it being there, no seeking it. It's there every morning. It was there. It was there. Um, 
I remember when I was a boy, every morning, I'm told by my mother, 6.30 every morning, the milkman came by with his horse and cart and left a couple of pints of milk on our doorstep. Every morning without fail, the, the milkman was a faithful worker and servant. It was always there, the milk. It was a bit like that with the Israelites. Every morning, the manna was there. But now, the Lord is saying, um, if you want to eat now, you've got to work for it. Oh dear. That song at harvest time, we plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. That's what it's going to be like. It's going to be a bit of a tough call. Yeah. Sounds like hard work, some people might have thought. Well, yes, but, you know, didn't God say to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, your labour? He lifted that curse for 40 years for the Israelites. They didn't have to work by the sweat of their brow to eat for 40 years. And now things have changed. Things changing every day. Things changing all the time in our lives. We've got to learn to live with them and give glory to God and know he's with us. Hard work from now on. I found a wonderful um, quote from the 35th President of the United States of America. For those of you that are not as old as I am, uh, that was um, J.F. Kennedy. It's strange how I remember, we remember things like when Kennedy was murdered, killed in Dallas, 1963. I remember where I was. I was just heading towards play with te table tennis in, a, in our church, church hall at the back of the building. And I heard that Kennedy had been shot. I remember where I was driving to church one Sunday morning, Gravel Hill, and I heard on the radio that Diana, Princess Diana, had died in a crash in a tunnel in Paris. But the quote I want to bring to you uh, is very interesting. J.F. Kennedy's quote about the future, he said, and change, he said this, those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Let me say that again. Those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. However old we might get, we still must look to the future. Because there's a future for us in Christ, whether we're in the body on earth or in the presence of the Lord in glory. So now we come to verse 13. From the book of Joshua. I think it's um, an interesting, I think it's chap chapter 5 of Joshua. Um, I think I'll read this to you. Um, it's just worth reading. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped in Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate that food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they ate the produce of Canaan. I've talked about that. Now we come to verse 13 of chapter 5. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither he replied, But as the commander of the army of the Lord I have come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence, and asked him, What message does my Lord have for my servant? He served me. The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jer Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. Not one went out or came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Make seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark 
On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, make all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up every man straight in. Hmm. Every man straight in. There's things to learn from this story. It says in verse 13 that Joshua looked up and saw a man when he was standing near Jericho. And he asked him, are you for us or against us? And he said, neither. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Um, it's an interesting vision he has. You see... Jericho was the first city that needed to be defeated to uh, to really defeat the enemy in the land. Um, and Jericho is in the centre of the land and when they, if they could win Jericho, they could go to the left or the right and they could over, take over the whole country. So who was this man with a, a sword that was pointed in the direction of, of Jericho? He says he's the captain of the Lord of Hosts. Some people believe that this was a theophany, or more particularly a Christophany, a pre-incarnate visit to Joshua, the son of God himself. You see, he does call him Lord in verse 14. We can't be sure. Uh, some people think he was a senior angel or an archangel, but it looks like it was a theophany. It was a pre-incarnate vision. Son of God. What is the Holy Spirit saying to Joshua? And to us through this amazing appearance of this man. We'll never fight alone our battles. The Lord is the battle who brings us the victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. And then he says these words, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. These are the same words that God spoke to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy ground. In other words, be reverent. Be, rever rever be reverent to me. Be reverent. So Mo Joshua had a private visit before his really public actions with his people. He was prepared now for this great next um, talent, great next um, battle. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. We know from the reading further on that the people living in Jericho had heard about the crossing of the Red Sea by this nation of Israel. And they'd also heard now about the amazing crossing of the river. Uh, to, to head towards their fortified town, the strongly walled town. Um, they were scared. They were fearful. There was a fear factor among the Canaanites from what they'd heard about the power of God working through this people. But of course, their city was defended by warriors and great walls. And uh, Jericho was a was a hard place and the israelites had had no experience at all at siege warfare or battering rams and stone throwing engines and scaling ladders they had nothing nothing like that at all um as someone said we are apt to fight the world with weapons from its arsenal and that's a big mistake well for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but I think it's rather good to remember that um, the Israelites didn't need scaling ladders and uh, battering rams and stone throwing engines. It just needed God on their side, and he was. Verse 2, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Not notice, I will deliver. I have delivered Jericho. It's done. It's done, Joshua. Uh, it's just like Christianity. Christianity isn't do, but done. Jesus' word on the cross, 
It is finished. Completed. Done. And with that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It says in John 19. John, he said, no one will take my life. I'll give it. I give it. It is finished. The Greek word he used was tetelestai. It's, a, it's an amazing word. Um, it's used in several ways, and in each way, it, it's absolutely spot on for Jesus. It shows that a bill has been paid, a price has been paid. It has, for our redemption. It reveals that a task is finished. It can't be repeated, it's done forever. It also means that a sacrifice has been offered, and it had. The Lord, our Lord himself was a sacrifice. And it also meant a masterpiece was completed. This incredible work of redemption that had been planned before the foundation of the world was now completed. The masterpiece completed is used in the context of a, an artist with the final brush stroke on that amazing painting. And then he says, it is finished. So for Joshua, the job was done. Now he must act in faith because the Lord has given the victory, embrace the fact that it, he will be victorious. God may move in strange ways, but nevertheless, he moves in power and gives the, us victory. But of course, God speaks to our, us in promises, but they have to be heard, they have to be acted on. And that's the great thing about this victory in Jericho, uh, it's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. It says there, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the people marched around them seven days. Whose faith? Well, Joshua's faith and the people's faith. Faith in God's word makes sense to the heart, but not normally to our natural brains. God doesn't think like we think. And so this amazing miracle happened. The, we know the story so well. God gave these one, these mir this miracle of power to open up the promised land by defeating uh, the Canaanites, hold up behind stone walls in Jericho. I want to cl close with this. It was an amazing experience in 2018 for myself and my wife and others on a, in a tour party to stand in the ruins of Jericho. It was never rebuilt. God put a curse on it. It would never be rebuilt. And there's this big mound. You can see it's on the top of a hill. And the stonework is massive. What's well, even what's left now, all these thousands of years later. It's an awesome thing to read this story on standing on the actual ruins of, of, the, of the original ancient Jericho. It was a desperately wicked city. We know how Rahab and her family were saved because they believed God. Today, when you hear the word Jericho mentioned, like in the parable of Good Samaritan and Jesus' day, uh, the road to Jericho, it was not the Jericho that we're talking about. It's a Jericho that was rebuilt. There was a new Jericho built about a mile away down the road. But the old Jericho, with its curse on, has never been built. Never. It stands to a testimony of God's power and to the victory he gave of people that had no experience of siege warfare to bring them into the promised land. God promised Abraham a land and they were beginning to open up to it and receive the promises. I'm going to close now. Perhaps we have spiritual Jericho standing in our way to enter into the land of form, the fullness of Christ well friends consecrate yourself put yourself in order before God and then stand on his promises he will give you the victory we are more than conquerors in Christ hallelujah praise the Lord experience that in your own personal life with your Jerichos as I seek to do with my Jerichos we can win the battle and we can walk on in the knowledge that Christ is with us and we are more than conquerors through whatever the devil throws at us, whatever circumstances face us. However, however things seem so strange and unusual to us, we just do how God speaks to us, obey his word and we shall walk in the same victory 
that the Israelites under Joshua worked walk so long ago. By the way, the name Joshua is really, the term is called Jesus in the New Testament. Hallelujah. God bless you. See you later.